search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. I got to Proverbs 2 and he said, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I got to Matthew 7, 7, and he said, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. I got to James 4, 8, and he said, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. But in Revelation, he turns the tables around completely. In Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. That night, I got on my knees and cried out to God, If you are really there, and if I am really on the right track by reading this book and praying, I've got to hear it from you. That night, Romans 8.16 spoke to me. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He washed away all the pain and shame. I have never been the same since. I was released in 1987. In 1990, I began preaching at the Cook County Jail by God's grace. I have served as a chaplain there for 20 years. I've shared the gospel with more than 100,000 maximum security prison inmates across the country and around the world. I've been privileged to speak in places like the Moody Bible Institute, Trinity Seminary, Trinity International University Bible Colleges and Pastors Conferences, Youth Rallies, Churches, Prisons around the world. No, only they, <clears throat> they think I have a Ph.D. in theology. Not only do I not have a Ph.D., I'm a high school dropout, an ex-convict, and I don't even have a fishing license. I want to leave you with an illustration, and this is good. I recently walked into the Cook County Jail and took the elevator to the security office on the third floor. I got off the elevator and there was a sergeant sitting at the desk I hadn't seen in some time. I've known this man for at least 20 years and every time he sees me, he mocks me. He mocks God and Christianity. I walked in and he said to two officers in the corner, the Christians are here, call out the lions. I said, Sergeant, I would like to remind you it has it was 2,000 years ago the Roman Empire was feeding Christians to the lions. And we have the incredible perspective of being able to look back over 2,000 years of recorded history. And what do we see? There are more Christians alive at this moment than the total number of people that made up the Roman Empire over its entire 500-year history. And the lions and the tigers, they're on the endangered species list. We're not afraid of lions. Bring them on. <clears throat> so I, I thought that was, that was pretty good. That was well worth remembering. So you can take that away from, from today. Um, so the Gideons, we're about placing Bibles places. And we can only do that through the help of the church and people donating money. And by the way, all the money and dollars that you give to buy Bibles buys Bibles, our dues and so forth, pays for the, the administrative cost of our, of our company, organization. Uh, it's all men donating their time, professional and business men. And many times I'm amazed at what just a single Bible can do when it's placed, you know, we've heard about in a prison and the little brown one he's talking about. little brown one he was talking he mentioned he saw is the ones we call personal workers testament testament that uh, we buy and, and pass out ourselves the little red ones goes out to uh, the schools we have ones like this as hotel motel bible we call those cost five dollars these little ones cost 25 green ones are given at colleges we have some little Camouflage ones we give at military. Speaking of college, I've been able to take Bibles to, uh, to the university at Moorhead uh, several years. And this past year, a couple of incidents happened that I, uh, 
I almost didn't get to go because I didn't find out till the last minute that they was going to do it that day. And so I rushed and I, was, I thought, said, well, you don't have time to go. But another thought said, I need to go. So I wanted to and I called and I said, I'll be a little bit late, but I'll be there. And I got there and we was on the corner. They won't let us do it up in the, on the campus except for there was one place they call a, a, a public speech area, I think it is. And and you can pass out anything, I guess, there or whatever. So they, they said, well, you can do Bibles if you can do anything else. So I guess that's the way they looked at it. But anyway, had some people there, and then some of us were scattered around on the sidewalks off of campus. And I was kind of still on the edge of it, I think. But anyway, a young man came over to me, and I, as, as he was walking out of his class and coming down the street, and I said, would you like to have a... A Bible, a New Testament, and he looked at me like he had no clue what I was talking about. And he looked at the book, and he took it, and he, I said, I was trying to explain the New Testament. He said, New, new. This is so. This is a new book, and I said, well, Yes. And I was trying to explain a little bit what the I, the Bible. I said, Do you believe in God? Oh, yes. And we spoke, talked just a little bit back and forth, and I saw that he was a foreign student, and I said, Where are you from? And he said, Saudi Arabia. And so I don't know what his background of teaching was. I would assume maybe Muslim or whatever. But uh, he took the Bible and walked on off and went and sat down. And I noticed he began reading. It was an area right over there where they, where they sat. And I later learned that that's where most of the, the kids from Saudi Arabia comes and, and meets and so forth. But I thought that was, I was really thrilled to be able to do that. Also, a little bit later, another guy came along to the, corner there and stopped and wrote down his window and looked out and he said don't never stop what you're doing he said in uh, I don't remember the dates and place exactly but something like 1965 on the campus of Mississippi State a young man, a man handed me a testament and I learned his I had heard of his story but I hadn't heard it and met him exactly but he was an atheist now he's pastoring a church in Moorhead and uh, that Bible that they gave him there on the campus changed his life, and he became saved. And I, we hear lots of those kind of testimonies of people just from a Bible that they received, how they give their heart to the Lord. <clears throat> this man, he was a born-again brain scientist, it said. I'm a born-again brain scientist. By the world's standards, I was too old and too educated to be saved. I was a clueless medical school professor with a dual PhD in neurobiology and biophysics. I had no interest in spiritual matters. I'd never read the Bible and attended church rarely to, just to please my devout Christian wife. I thought that Christianity was her hobby. When I was 52 years old, I was rushed by an ambulance to a local hospital. The emergency room doctor quickly transferred me into the cardiac intensive care unit. As a medical school professor, I fully understood the implications of data displayed on this CICU electronic monitors. It meant that I was as good as dead. In my desperation, I called out to a God who I did not know, and I said aloud, God, if you're a God, send me a messenger to show me where I made a wrong turn. A nurse came into my room. She had the countenance of a Christian. And she 